series on um, blending parenting, set parenting. This is a great series. I'm very excited to say we have um, Paige Michaelis and Maureen Greiner here from One Minute Mommy. They are a resource and parenting and caregivers um, um, practice that comes in and they give all kinds of classes and different resources to help parents and care providers um, tackle the tough issue, issues. And this is a part of um, our resiliency piece here at um, Headquarters US SOCOM. So Paige and, and um, Maureen, you want to come over so I can introduce you? This is Paige and this is Maureen. And I'm going to go ahead and let you get started then and talk a little bit about yourself. And thank you so much for coming. Great. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thanks for having us. Hi everybody, I'm Paige Michaelis with One Minute Mommy. Um, I'm a uh, certified positive discipline educator and I founded One Minute Mommy about a year ago to provide parents and caregivers with family resources and parenting education and we're really excited to be here today with you. This is my colleague Maureen Greiner. Good morning and also very grateful to be here and even though it's my first time ever being at MacDill Air Force Base. I feel like I'm home yes. in some ways because before I moved to the Tampa area um, a year and a half ago, I taught classes at Fort Carson, Colorado for about 17 years. So working with military families is really my passion. And part of that comes from the fact that my husband was in the Army for 10 years, and my dad's a retired senior chief from the Navy, and my oldest son was in the Navy. So I have yes. lots of... Um, passion and understanding and just great, great gratitude you guys do. And I know that the military lifestyle can really be challenging for families. So we feel really passionate about giving you guys as much good information as we can today about yes. blended families. Absolutely, absolutely. So Maureen's going to start off just by giving a little bit of an overview about blended families, how they can come together with respect, love, communication. And, and we're also going to, uh, are we going to have uh, the ability to do questions and answers today yes. too? Okay, so if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask the presentation and we're here to support you. So I'll let Maureen take it from here. Okay, so we're going to just talk about some top tips that you want to think about. And an hour is, you know, of course, you know, people like me who like to talk, we never have enough time to talk about all the things we want to talk about. So. You know, there's never enough time. We're going to kind of go through it a little quick and give you as much information, as many good tips as we can. And just like Paige said, if you have questions, please feel free to ask questions, and we will try and get to as much stuff as we can. Okay? So when we think about step families or blended families, um, most of the time we're thinking about, you know, issues that we may have with the children. And trying to combine two families together. Sometimes both of you may have children, maybe just one of you has children and the other one is new to the parenting role, it's brand new for you. Um, but the very first thing I want you to think about in having a great step family or a happy and healthy step family is to think about your marriage. Now see, this is something that we tell all couples and we tell all families, each step families otherwise, okay, is that it's really, really important that you're, you and your spouse build the foundation for your family and that you do put your marriage first. Now, you put your marriage first no matter what. Well, maybe not always. There might be times when you do have to put your kids' needs above those of your spouse. But in general, we know that kids do so much better if they can live in a home with a mother and a father that's secure and stable. So the very most important thing you want to do to start off your set family right is to really, really focus on your new marriage. Now, having said that, now I'm going to tell you some of the bad news, right? Like I don't want to always give the bad news, but I want to be honest with people. And the truth of the matter is, is that we all know that if we take marriages and we look at how many of them end up in divorce, what percentage are we looking at? 40%. Okay, 40 to 50%, right? Mm -hmm. That's for first marriages. What do we know about second marriages? 70. It's 60 to 70. It's 60 to 70. Now, I know, you're like, why are you starting off there? That's kind of depressing, right? Well, it's because I want to give you the truth. You know, I want to give you the truth about what's really, what, what you're really looking at. It's not that there's not hope, because I could give you a long list of examples of couples that have made it in second families. 
to include my own dad and stepmom. We've been married for 25 years, and we have a wonderful relationship. I mean, there's lots of great examples out there, but you need to know right at the onset that you've got to work extra hard for this. This is going to take some work. I hope that in a minute you might understand why. Now, does anyone here know? Oh, let's, let's go back. Does anybody here know what the number one predictor of divorce is? Lack of communication. Okay, lack of communication, definitely on the right track. Any other ideas? Okay, so what most people will say when I teach marriage classes, what most people say when I say, what is the number one predictor of divorce? What people say all the time, all the time I get infidelity, which certainly for many of us that would be a deal breaker, right? So. For most of us think, okay, infidelity definitely um, would lead to divorce. Or some people may say money issues, and it's very interesting because we know that regardless of income, that money tends to be the number one thing that couples fight about. But none of those are actually good predictors of divorce. And not a lot of couples can have those issues, whether it's infidelity or money or in-laws, and they still end up staying married for a long time. What we know is the number one predictor of divorce, kind of like communication, as someone in our audience said, it's how you handle your conflict. It's not whether or not you have conflict. It's what you do when you get the conflict. And in particular, I know this is going to sound crazy, but in particular, it's the avoidance of conflict. It's, and if you think about it, by the time you get to the point that you're avoiding conflict, it's usually because you've had a lot of yucky conflict that's turned really, really bad. To the point that somebody says, I'm not doing this anymore. And they do something that we call avoidance. Okay? Now, definitely a stereotype, but who do you think avoids more? Men or women? Okay, men, right? Right away now, so here are men. And and that's true. That's true. Now, it's not true in every case. There are certainly relationships where women do more of the avoiding, but not to pick on the guys, but guys tend to do more of the avoiding. And if this was a marriage class, we could go on and on and talk about why that is. Um, but if you're a guy out there, or if you're an avoider, I want you to really think about the fact that if you, every time you shut down and you avoid conflict when your spouse is trying to bring up a topic with you, that whether or not it's true, what that feels like to your spouse, is like you don't care. So you might be shutting down because it's overwhelming and you don't want to have a big fight. But your spouse is feeling like you don't care. Okay? Now, in my relationship, I am not the avoider. Okay? I do this thing that I like to call, and we scientifically, you know, in this field, call pursuing. Okay? What do you think that what do you think I mean by we pursue? Go after it. Right? Like, okay. Go, go, go. Here we go. I call it pursuing, but my husband calls it nagging. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And here's the thing. After 25 years of marriage, I still sometimes I forget this, but if I tell my husband, if I walk into the bathroom and his clothes are laying all over the floor, and I, and I say to him, oh my God, you're such a pig. I cannot believe you leave your clothes everywhere. What am I, your maid? He has not once in 25 years said to me, you know what, Maureen, you're right. Let me hurry up and pick up these clothes. I, thank you for correcting me, right? That's what we call a harsh startup, which we know leads to a lot of avoidance. So if we're telling the avoider to stand strong and talk about things, what I'm asking the pursuer to do is to bring up those conflicts in a nice way. Okay? Like rather than saying, you're such a pig, you leave your clothes all over the place, if I were to say to my husband, oh my gosh, you know what, I am very, I'm overwhelmed, I have too much to do, I have this going on and that going on, can you please help me out by picking up your clothes? He's more likely to help me out, right, mm -hmm. than if I start off by telling him what a piggy is. Agreed? Okay. So what in the world does this have to do with step family? Right? Well, all I can, what I'm thinking of with this is that if... A couple who come together and have no kids, right? They get married and they start a family, and we know that in that situation there's a lot of things that bring up conflict, and there's a lot of learning to do throughout the years of how to handle that conflict, how to make all that work. I can't even imagine the conflict that comes up when you have two people trying to blend two families together with children and all of that conflict too. 
you know, and of course, not only is it just going to be that you have a lot more conflict, but you're going to have to find new ways to handle it. It's the only way it's going to work. So the very first tip I have for you as making your blended family work is to work on your marriage, put your marriage first in the sense that you spend a lot of time figuring out how to handle conflict. And there's a lot of good resources. I'm sure you can get great resources um, at your local military base, whether it's talking to a chaplain or a mental health professional, or even just some really good books, like Fighting for Your Marriage, which I know is one that has been definitely you know, improved upon by the military or impressed on by the military. So I would say get some good ideas about how you're going to handle your conflict. That's probably one of the most important things you can do for your family. Any questions? Yes. How do you handle the conflict of the ex who wants to tell you how to, how to handle the kids when they're with you and not with her or him? You know, it's really hard. And part of the issue that it's always like tricky to walk on, right, is and there's never enough time to talk about it. But part of it is that, you know, a lot of marriages broke down. First marriages broke down be not because somebody was bad and somebody was evil, though in some cases it might have been that too. But a lot of it happened because there was a lot of conflict, right? We're seeing that's the number one predictor of divorce. And a lot of people think that when they get a divorce, the conflict's going to end. But what happens when you get divorced? It increases. So one of the most important things you can do to help yourself and your current family and you know keep that bridge between your ex and their kids open is to learn some good conflict skills for yourself to learn some good conflict skills and also you know you have to put some boundaries around your new family and your old family and we're going to talk a little bit more about that but with every, you know the people who are not going to fall into the 60 70 percent you're going to do some work on themselves. You're going to do some work on yourselves, even though it's hard. Do some work in figuring out, well, how do I need to go about this differently? Because, like I said, it's not a marriage class. I wish it was. We could talk on and on. But it's not about finding a magical right person. It's about learning some new skills so that you build this person into a, you have a magical life with them. So learning to work on some conflict resolution skills with your new partner may help you with some of the lingering stuff with your ex. Does that make sense? Any other questions? OK. So the second tip I have is that love takes time. What do you think I mean by that? What do you think I mean by love takes time? Love takes time between you and your spouse? Okay. Between everybody. You know, it's like, here's the thing. When you first met your new partner, right? And you first started having a relationship together. It's crazy time, right? You fall head over heels madly in love with this person, right? Or so it seems. Or so it seems. And what we know now scientifically is that beginning part of relationship, it's really very chemically induced. Okay, I like to tease people and say they're on drugs. You're on drugs for the first two years of your relationship, right? And real love takes time. Real love takes ups and downs, and it takes relationship building and having things that you share together, good and bad. Well, you know what? That's the same for with kids, except for you don't get to have that crazy I'm on drugs time. All right? You don't get to have that time when your hormones are fluctuating and you're madly in love with this other person. When you have a brand new child in your life, and they have a brand new adult in their life, there's no magic there like it is between two adults that are and it just takes time. It just takes time. And to really stop and consider what does it take to really build a relationship between you and that other human being? You know, if everything is going to, if, if I'm an adult and I'm going to come in and my role with this new child in my life is that I'm going to make sure he has food and a, and a safe place to sleep every night, and then I'm going to do lots and lots of discipline and punishment. I'm probably not going to have a very good relationship with them. It takes time. It's kind of an old rule of thumb, and it, it might be a hard one to take, but they, say, they used to say that the age that you come into your stepchild's life, that's how many years it takes before that child is really going to accept you as a parent. Now, I don't know if that's completely true. That's, that's just kind of like an old wives' tale that they used to say in therapy. 
because I've seen it happen sooner than that. But it is true that if you come into a child's life and they're two, you're going to end up assuming more of a parent role than if you come into a child's life when you're 12. And it takes time. It takes time to build that relationship. And to me, being a parent, calling someone mom or dad, it's a very sacred, sacred role. It's not kind of, not, not just anybody can walk in and be dad. Not just anybody. It takes years and years of trust building, right? To where you really have learned to trust and value this other person, and you know that they're, what they're doing is in the best interest of you, even when you don't agree with it. Right? You can't just walk in off the street and do that. It takes some time. It takes some time to really build that relationship, you know? And it's not just the good stuff. I mean, I, I really would encourage you, and love takes time, to make sure that you're spending one-on-one -on -one time with kids, that you're taking them and doing the things that they like to do and building those relationships. But it's not always about the good stuff. You know, when I was working for the Army and I worked with a lot of parents that had little babies, right? And a lot of these little babies were born maybe when dads were away, dads were deployed. And dads would come back and these babies would be like maybe three or four months old. And moms would be like, oh, I don't know if I can leave, you know, little Johnny here with dad because Dad doesn't know how to change the diaper right. He doesn't know when he's crying this way that he wants a bottle. When he's crying this way, you got to tap him on his tush just like this. Dad doesn't know all that stuff. And the thing is, is that how else is Dad going to learn all that stuff if Dad doesn't have that time with him? You know, when you bring your babies home, and they're brand new little babies, not every night goes smoothly, right? Who here has stayed up all night long with a sick child? Okay? <laughs> not that that's... A do it as fast as possible. The matter is, is that those hard through them bond you to that child, maybe even more so than the easy time. And that we don't want to take that experience away from a dad that's had a baby born while he's deployed. It takes time. You also don't want to dump the But certainly, he needs an hour or two with that baby at a time to start to go through some of those hard times and those challenges and feel competent. The same is true in step families. You know, you don't want to, you know, you, I would highly discourage, you know, getting remarried, have, bringing in your kids and saying, okay, now you take care of the kids while I go on a six-month deployment. I would highly discourage that. I know sometimes it happens, but I would say if you can make that not happen, that would be better, right? Um, but at the same time, when you're all together, sometimes the biological parent needs to step out and let those two people build their own relationship. It takes some time. It doesn't happen automatically. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions about that? Okay, so love takes time. You know, one way that I like to think about um, building a relationship is something we call an emotional bank account. Okay, so who here has a checking account? Okay, so how a checking account works is that, you know, if I Right? And then when I go to the mall and I want to buy some new clothes, right? It used to be I wrote a check, but I don't know I call it a checking account anymore. I just write checks, right? Now I take out my debit card, right? I buy my new outfit, and when I swipe the card, they take the money from where? My checking account, right? Okay. But if I don't have any money in the checking account, and I go to Dillard's and try and buy the new outfit, and I go to swipe the debit card, what happens? It gets rejected, right? It says it's not approved, declined, or whatever. Because why? There's nothing there to pay for the outfit, right? There's nothing there to pay for my purchase. So take that idea and think about it in a relationship. Okay? That in a relationship, every interaction we have with a person that we're in a relationship with, we're either making a deposit into our emotional bank account or we're taking out a withdrawal. Okay? So when I do loving and kind things for my husband, I'm building up that account, right? When I tell him he's a pig for leaving his clothes on the floor, what am I doing? That's a withdrawal. And you know, some withdrawals are bigger than others, right? Right? Here's the thing about kids and emotional bank accounts is that we like to think that because we, you know, make their dinner, buy their dinner, give them a place to live, buy them clothes, take them to school every morning, 
that that emotional bank account that we have with them, that it should be full. Look at all we do for them, right? Look at all of those wonderful things that we do for these little kids. Well, sadly for kids, those aren't really deposits, all right? One day they become deposits. When they have kids of their own and they realize how hard you worked, okay? But when they're kids, those kinds of things aren't deposits. What do you think are deposits for kids? Spending time with them. Spending time with them, right? And I don't necessarily their homework, right? Like I said, it's kind of like that's you can't mess with that one right now. One day that will come back, okay? But you don't get that right now. It's spending time doing interactive things, things they like to do, right? Building the relationship, all those little things. It could be helping them with the science project. It could be things like that. But it's all those little things you've got to build that account up because if you have kids, are you going to make a withdrawal? You are going to. Why? Because they get on your nerves. Because <laughs> they get on your nerves, yes. <laughs> You may have a penchant for being bothersome sometimes, right? Because you're the parent and you have to. Because you're the parent and sometimes you have to, right? You have to say, no, you can't go to that party. That's a withdrawal, right? Well, here's the thing. In a step family, that's why I say it takes time. If you just walk in and you're brand new in this child's life, what is that bank account like? In fact, it might be negative because if you just took mom or dad's attention away from me, you're starting out with drawing, right? That's what you're starting out with. It can take some time to build that up. It takes some time to build that up. And that's the way to think about it when you're thinking about how am I going to discipline this child or get this child on track and all those things. You're, those are withdrawals. You can't go there yet. You can't go there yet. You've got to start with making the deposits. Does that make sense? Any questions? OK. Tip number three, empathy and respect for all, but not necessarily sympathy. Okay, so as a therapist, when I would work with a family that was a step family, when you're sitting on the outside, okay, and you have this family in front of you, and you're looking at them, and you're looking at how hard these people are coming, how hard they're working, coming together to try and make this work, I can have a lot of empathy. And what I mean by that is that I try and look at each person and understand where they're coming from. And when you really sit down and do that and you really think about that and you really feel for that other person, it makes you see them in a different light. I mean, for example, I can think of a family where it was a blended family and the dad was, you know, I thought, you know, just if I just first glance was thinking, gosh, he is really mean to those his stepkids. Like he's really like just, you know, come in there and he's going to take charge and he's going to tell them what to do. And he's really being kind of mean, right? When I get to know the guy a little bit better, when I find out and like, shame on me, I didn't think of it sooner. You know, parent is a brand new role for him. He didn't get the chance to have that little person from a tiny little baby and fall in love slowly. Like, he walked into a situation where he has a five and a seven-year-old. And he really wants to help them and doesn't know how. He's a brand new parent. Imagine if when your baby was born, it was five years old, right? That's what it's like. And, and he doesn't have the skills. I mean, I think by the time I had a five-year-old, I had five years to practice my skills, and I still wasn't that great all the time, you know? And I'm expecting him to be perfect. So I can look at him and see that point of view. I can look at his wife, who really, really loves him dearly, kids dearly, and is trying so hard to make everybody happy, and I can have a lot of empathy for her, right? Like, how hard is that? You're trying to protect your kids and make sure that they're okay, but you also really love your husband and want to acknowledge all that he's done to step up to the plate and help become a parent to these children as well. That's empathy. And if we, if we have empathy for mom and dad in that situation, what about the kids? What do you think? What do you think it's like for kids being in a step family? Scary. Scary. Why do you say scary? They don't know what to expect. They don't know if this means that they're never going to see their other parent again or if they're going to be hit 
B. You know, they don't know what they're getting. It's like all of a sudden their routine and their security things, the way things were, are all of a sudden turned upside down, or maybe turned upside down, but they're changed, right? And, and I think that one of the things we know about stress is that, you know, one of the best things that, to help with stress is when you feel like you have some control, okay? So that if I'm in a situation where I feel like this is, this is not good for me, this is really bad, I don't know what I'm going to do, I as an adult can start thinking, what do I need to do to make it better, right? Can a little five-year-old do that? A little five-year-old is really not, I mean, if stepdad is really off the tongue, can't say, you know what, I think we should get a divorce. Right? I mean, I don't want to say the word trapped, but they're kind of trapped. And have a lot of empathy for what it's like in, kid, in kids in these situations. And if, those, you know, if you have kids in that situation, whether you're the mom or the dad or some variation of that, I want you to have empathy, which means that feeling into, you're trying to understand what your spouse is feeling. But I really want you to stop before you do any kind of discipline, anything like that, and really, really, really imagine what it's like these kiddos. Um, for a lot of families that I work with, the, the change between living in one home, divorce, and living now in a step family is a very short amount of time. And for their little minds to catch up with all those transitions, it can be really hard. It's hard for the adults. Like, imagine how hard it is for the kids. And really to have some empathy for to really have some understanding that, yeah, you can see it all logically at 32, okay? But at five, it's, it doesn't work like that. And there is a lot of fear. It is like, oh, my gosh, what about my dad? What about my mom? Um, a lot of people seem to think that a lot of the kind of um, challenges that stepchildren might put towards their stepparent has to do with the fact that now it means that their parents' relationship is really, really over and that they had this like romanticized vision of their parents would get back together and now that's ended. And what I found is that might be true for a handful, but for most kids that that's not that's not where the problem is. The problem is is that they need that security and that stability. And things were a certain way and now all of a sudden they're changed. And that those things need to be negotiated and you need to give them some time. That it's usually not about, I don't like you because now it means mom can't get back with dad. It's usually they're not quite that sophisticated. Sometimes, maybe teenagers, but not, not our little kids. Okay. Any questions on the empathy part? So empathy for everybody. And just a little thing about respect. How do you guys define respect? What is respect? Well, I will tell you what my definition of respect is, okay? Respect is any time that you show someone or something that they're important and that they matter, okay? I can show respect for a human being, of course, because I believe all human beings are important and matter, um, even if I don't like them. But, you know, that's why, you know, I can always, this is a good example to use to the military group because, you know, you can have an officer or someone that outranks you and not really like them as a person, but you can still show them respect because you respect that rank and what it means to have gotten there, right? So even if you don't like them, you still respect the rank, right? You can respect things, like I'm not going to, like, take a marker and draw all over the wall because even that wall has value. Okay? So... In our interactions with our kids, I always like to think, are we treating them with respect? Because I hear a lot of parents say they want respect. A lot of times when they say they want respect, it's fear. It's respect is not fear. Okay? I can not like you, but be really scared of you. I can have no respect for you, but be really scared of you. Okay? They're not the same thing. Respect is that you matter, your feelings matter. And what I know is that when kids get treated like they matter and their feelings matter, they eventually reciprocate. They, they know that there's a place. Okay? So everybody needs respect, it's not just the adults. Kids need to be respected too. So respecting them means having understanding for where they've come from. Saying, so yeah, it must feel kind of challenging to all of a sudden be in a new family, all of a sudden, family, all of a sudden have to share your room with somebody else when you had a room all to yourself or whatever the situation may be. Any thoughts on that? Okay. So, tip number four is get a plan. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Okay? 
So this is to hopefully come up with some ways that you're not waiting until those moments when everything's going crazy and you're in crisis to try and figure out what you want to do and what your values and um, ideas are as a family. It's talking together ahead of time. Hey, do you want to talk about this area? Do we do buckets first or do you want to do? Go ahead and start with the buckets. Okay. So this is, the idea of buckets is this, and it's something that I learned a long time ago when I was working with children that had a lot of challenges and that were really having a hard time in school. And the idea of buckets is this, is that we tend to think, okay, here are the rules, and everybody must follow the rules all the time, 100%. There's no way to ever negotiate or be outside of those rules. And that is really a recipe for disaster. And so when I work with step families, one thing I really like for them to do is for mom and dad to come together, and if the kids are old enough, the kids too, and to talk about different behaviors that might exist within the family that would be acceptable and not acceptable. And then we put those behaviors into three different buckets, okay? So bucket A is absolutely, we must address this the minute it happens. We cannot ignore it. We cannot negotiate about it. This is a big deal. These are the biggest, most important things in your family. In my family, they usually have to do with safety. Okay, but they could also have to do with morality. Okay, um, is it unsafe? Is it um, immoral? Or is it illegal? Okay, if it's one of those three things, then you got to address it right now. So, um, if we're a step family and um, I am home with a two-year-old who is brand new to me. Okay, I've just we've just gotten married. I haven't been parenting this two-year-old for a long time, and the two-year-old runs into the road. I cannot say. I'm going to let her dad deal with that when he gets home, okay? What do I, I, have to, I have to address it right now, right? Just like um, if I have a teenager, if I'm in a step family and this teenager is new to me, okay, we have, have a new relationship, and I walk into the room and the teenager has something inappropriate on the computer, okay? I cannot be like, oh, quick, shut that door. I'll let the dad talk to him. I'll let his dad talk to him when he comes home. Now, I have to address that right now. Okay, now I would say if both parents are there in that situation, it would be better to get their biological parent with you so you're addressing together. But those are things that are bucket A are those things that you have to address. You cannot let them wait. Okay, Bucket B are things that maybe can wait. Or maybe you can negotiate on them. Maybe they're not like right away, right away. Like let's say I'm home with that same two-year-old and we're having dinner. And then she refused to eat her peas. Do two-year-olds do that? Is that a battle I have to have? That's not a battle I have to have, right? In fact, that one might even go into bucket C where we forget about it. Okay, we just say, all right, you know, eat something, right? And we'll have a healthy snack later, right? But the idea behind A, B, and C is you think about what are the things you have to address and address right now? And you make an agreement as a couple that if these happen and both of us are not there, we're going to do something about it. Okay? B, we're either going to negotiate with the kiddos or we might say, you know what, I don't agree with that. We're going to talk. We need to come and talk about it together as a family. And Paige is going to talk to you guys about mm -hmm. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And C would be forget about it. Who cares? Right? Like if your teenager wants to wear silly clothes, I don't mean inappropriate clothes. I mean, you know. They're teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> but at, at seven and eight, like nine, they wear whatever the heck they want. That's right. They have themselves dressed. Good job. <laughs> One thing, too, I wanted to mention is just the um, coming together as a couple to really discuss what your values are and what your values are kind of uh, individually. And then also what values you would like to present to your blended family. It's a really great exercise to go through. And on my website, I actually have a large list of values that people can take a look at and sit down and work with together to be able to pull those together. So then you can actually, once the couple has come up with them, then you can share those with your children also and say, you know what, these are the, the top 10 values that are really important to our family and we wanted to share those with you and bring you into the loop about what's important to us as now that we're all one. And in talking about the bucket B, one of my favorite, favorite tools, and again, a way in which to share the values is called a family meeting. And does anybody have family meetings now? Anybody hold family meetings? Or used to hold family meetings? <laughs> okay, a couple people. 
Family meetings are an incredible tool, and really, um, what I'm what I think about when when we're well, what we think about when we're holding a family meeting is what are the long-term skills and characteristics we want to teach our children at the end of the day? So Maureen is talking about mutual respect. We're talking in a family meeting, problem solving is a big one, right? We can come together and we can solve these, these uh, negotiated things, these things that we don't want to deal with right away. Um, but so there's a lot of tools around family meetings that really work to bring the family together. So let me tell you how they how they work and how I work them in my own family. Um, there's a decided upon time. So weekly family meetings are ideal in this day and age. Pretty difficult, <laughs> I will admit to that. Mine are probably about every two or three weeks or so. But you want to have them as consistently as possible. Post a place in your kitchen where people, everyone within the family, ages four and up, anybody who can write, can add a meeting agenda. Okay, and this initially could be relatively long. You don't want it to be huge for your first family meeting, though, because then nobody's going to want to come, right? So I would say once you have your agenda set, to pick maybe one or two things that you want to address. And the other thing that I did when I first started my family meetings was I always made it about things we had to work on. And then I realized that my kids didn't want to come anymore <laughs> because it was my agenda versus um, adding in any fun things also. So be sure to also add in some fun topics to your family meeting agenda, which could include, you know, that we're going to Disney this weekend, that we have grandma coming in and let's all talk together about what that might look like for us. So uh, the other step to the family meeting is to assign roles. So if the children are old enough to write, have someone be a scribe and take notes at the family meeting. Have another person be the leader or the timer, a timing person for the family meeting. And again, this is building those characteristics and skills in the children that we really want them to have in the long term. I like to think about the family meeting as kind of like a work meeting, like where you're getting together, but it's much more kind of intimate and fun. Um, and the goal of the family meeting is to really build consensus. So this is an opportunity for everyone to contribute, everyone to participate, everyone to put ideas out there. So in my family, um, my six-year-old, she wrote on the family meeting agenda that she wanted to talk about how to turn in her homework on time. And I was very impressed that she actually wrote that down because we knew that she had challenges with that. So we came together and everybody, including my other daughter, threw out different suggestions about how we could help Ursula to get our homework turned in on time. And then Ursula came up with, with which of those choices that she wanted to, to use to solve her problem. And then we tried that for a while and it worked pretty well. But the goal really is to have consensus around the different challenges that come up. So as things um, develop, you can uh, agree to try out a certain, certain solution. And if that doesn't work, then what you do is you come back at the next family meeting and say, you know what, that didn't work. Let's try something different this time. But, and I can't stress this enough, it's really about, um, giving everyone an opportunity to contribute. And I know that sometimes that's hard as parents, that sometimes it's like, oh, wait a second, I'm the parent, and I'm going <laughs> to tell you what needs to be done. But the more that you can do that, the more or the less misbehaviors you're going to have with your children, and the more um, blended and the more capable and contributing uh, members of the team you're going to have, so every person gets an equal say. At the end of a family meeting, you also want to do a fun activity, too. So even though it could get heated in the midst of it all, you want to be able to come together at the end of the day and play a game or go see a movie or you know, have ice cream together or something like that. So it's a really, really great tool to be able to use. And again, on my website, I have an entire handout available to everyone about family meetings and about kind of the do's and don'ts and that kind of thing. So be sure to check that out. And I just think that really being heard is one of the ways that you build relationships. So 
Mm -hmm. It's like when you really feel like you're hurt. Yes. I think the other thing that something like family meetings do is it comes to this bucket B and negotiate our delay is that a lot of times where we get into trouble in parenting, be it step parenting or parenting our biological children, is that this is where we get in trouble in many parts of life, not just parenting, is learning how to regulate what we feel. Mm -hmm. Like if we just act on, oh my gosh, I'm really mad right now, and we make choices based on that, they usually tend to be not great choices. And that's the magic of going, no, we're going to talk about this later. We're going to have a family meeting about it. Something like the homework is that you're teaching your children how to approach a problem in a calm, rational way. You know, it's not that right. there's no feeling involved. It's just you're not being led by the feeling. Right. You know, there's the moment you get that phone call from the teacher and says, you know, so and so didn't turn in their homework. That if you go with that initial feeling, you're like, what? I helped them do. I've been sitting at this sinking table for hours every night helping them do the homework, and they didn't turn it in. Are you kidding me? If I add, if I go from that place, it's not going to be necessarily the thing that's going to help them the most. Well, the other interesting thing that happened in that scenario is that Ursula felt much more empowered when she was able to contribute to the decision-making process around her problem. Because if I had just, which I did initially, I just said, well, you need to do this and this and this and this. <laughs> and then, you know, none of those solutions worked for her. But when she was a part of the process, she had much more attachment to actually doing, to solving and really the problem. someone's really listening to it then about what the real problem is. It's kind of like the, I don't know if you've seen the new YouTube video about the nail on the head, but I would say look it up if you haven't seen it. But it's the same thing with husbands and wives, right? Like, do you really, do you really feel heard? You know, mm -hmm. rather than someone just throwing out solutions to you that may not work. That's right. That That's may true. not work for you. So, yeah. yeah a lot mm -hmm. All right, I'm trying to think, was there something else I was gonna say on this part? I would just say definitely, um, Lots of, there's lots of room to negotiate with kids. There's lots of, you know, it doesn't always have to be your way. And I think that um, when it comes to bucket C, forget about it, at least for now. What I really want to encourage you to do as a step parent, especially if you're new as a step parent, if, if parenting is new to you, even if it's not new to you, get reacquainted with what's appropriate for different ages because truthfully, Kids do lots and lots and lots of things that bother us. We all agree with that? Like, we love them, but they can do lots and lots of things that are really bothersome. But not all the things they do that are bothersome are necessarily misbehavior. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, like, if you have a nine-month-old that throws all their food on the floor when you put them in the high chair, is that bothersome behavior or misbehavior? It's bothersome. The dog loves the thing, so the dog loves it. But for you as a parent, it might be bothersome, but it's not misbehavior. They don't really know any better. Okay? If your nine-year-old throws all the food on the floor, now we might be talking about some misbehavior. Okay, So really get knowledgeable. And I would just, one caveat to that is teenagers are still a work in progress. Their brains are not complete. Matter of fact, we know that for most males, the part of your brain, which is right here, that lets you plan out into the future, is really not complete until you're 25. I hope I'm not offending anybody who's listening. <laughs> but it's why, why males get in so many car accidents. You know, it's like that ability to kind of plan ahead and think, oh, if I drive like this, there might be some bad consequences, right? It's not quite completely developed yet. So just because they look like adults doesn't mean that they have the thinking capability of adults. Mm -hmm. One thing that all kids have, though, little to teenagers, is they all can feel like adults. What I mean by that is that they can feel sad just like you. They can feel lost just like you. They can feel lonely just like you. They don't have all the good thinking skills to deal with it yet. So just to keep that in mind as a step parent, too. Okay, and then a few more things. Let's see. Don't play favorites, even if you have them. Is it okay for a parent to have favorites? I, I think it's normal. It's normal, and by favorites, what I don't mean is that you love one child more than you love another child. What I mean is that it's normal to have a child that you feel more connected with or that you enjoy more, okay? Like, I'm an outdoors girl. I love to run and hike and camp and all those kinds of things. And my son, Wesley, who is my third, I have four boys. He's my third son. He loves all those things. So, obviously, we have a lot of good time together doing those kinds of things. My oldest son is an artist. He loves art, and I, I have so much admiration and love for his art, but that's not my thing. 
So it's not that I love Wesley more than I love Dustin. It's just Wesley's more likely to go on a hike with me, right? It's not I love Dustin just as much. It's just different, okay? Um, you have to be careful it doesn't become a vicious cycle because what happens is that when you look at one kid, are you, like, say that I were to take Wesley and say, oh, look, he likes to go hiking with me and doing all these things with him. So then what can happen is that as I give him more attention, the other kids can become disillusioned about that, right? So that when they're around me, maybe they're not as pleasant, which, what does that make me want to do? Spend more time with the one that I enjoy more, right? Which is, that's what I mean, it can be a vicious cycle. So, like, for myself, I have to learn to stop and say, I, I need to take the time to understand what it is about art that Dustin loves and understand his art. Does that make sense? So it can become a vicious cycle. Um, and that we're more likely to see what we think we're going to see. Okay, so, you know, if we believe that this child is a challenge, then we are going to see the challenges that this child has. Okay? So you're just more likely to see what you think you're going to see. You're more likely to hear what you think you're going to hear. And you have to fight that. I mean, the very best self-awareness is understanding that you don't really have a lot of self-awareness. Okay? That's like ultimate self-awareness. But to know that just because you believe it to be true, really challenge yourself. And it is that true all the time. And you look for what's different. Okay? So I know this stepchild of mine is really out to get me because he's really mad that I married his dad. Okay, I'm going to look for proof of the opposite. Does that make sense? Make sense? And apologize when you mess it up because you're going to mess it up. And that's relationship building. When you make a mistake and you go back and you go, I'm sorry, that, that, you know, that was not appropriate of me, that was wrong, I'm sorry that I hurt you that way, I don't want to hurt you that way, that's, that's building safety and trust in a relationship. Okay, Paige, were you going to say something? I just wanted to talk a little bit more about um, sibling rivalry, which can be a big challenge with step families. Um, and oftentimes with sibling rivalry, um, parents can make it worse. <laughs> they can make it a lot worse. And some of it has to do with uh, picking favorites or picking one child that's the good child over the bad child. And, and whenever they're fighting, always making the assumptions that you know who started the fight and who didn't start the fight. So, and let me ask you, do we ever really know who started the fight? <laughs> no. We don't, do we? I mean, I always thought I did until one day I saw my younger daughter going mm, like this to my older daughter. And I was like, hey, <laughs> wait a second. You're not the good one after all. <laughs> but we don't ever really, truly know what's going on with them behind the scenes. We really, really don't. And so that's something to keep in mind whenever their children are fighting. And, there's, and it's inevitable that there's going to be fights, especially when two families are coming right. together. It's going to happen. And some of it's normal, and some of it's completely natural, and some of it should be occurring, right? Because both of those children are trying to figure out kind of their relationship and their roles within the family and that kind of thing. But if, as a parent, we can step out of it and make it more their issue versus our own issue as much as possible, it's actually going to work towards having less fights than more fights few caveats to that though, right? <laughs> few caveats is that we do need to be able to teach them how to fight and teach them how to fight fairly. Not, I'm not talking about physical fighting or anything like that, but I'm talking about problem solving together, using appropriate language when they are discussing problems. Um, safety issues. So obviously if they are hitting each other and that kind of thing. That's not acceptable. What is acceptable in our family? How do we communicate? Does it need to go on the family meeting agenda? All of actually bringing them together and working out a plan to solve their problem. So again, teaching them appropriate ways in which to fight within the family. So there's a couple of things in positive discipline that I teach my parents when fighting does occur with their child. And so I'm going to give you four tools to be able to use. And the first one is called Beat It. And I, I don't have it on the slides or anything like that, but 
Beat it basically means that you're, you see your two children fighting or three children fighting or four children fighting and you stop. You don't beat them. You don't beat them. No, it's beat it, <laughs> not them. You stop. You take a look at Make sure that they see you. And then you basically turn around and walk away. Oh, no. That's beat it. <laughs> yep. And see what happens. And see what happens. Because like I said, sometimes when we're constantly getting involved with their fights, it's exacerbating that. And actually children at some sometimes would rather have that negative attention of us getting involved with that versus no attention at all. So by us so doing I something know I can different. Tune in by poking my little sister, right? Mm -hmm. Mom. Right. right, right, exactly. So the next tool is called Barrett, and Barrett is similar. So you witness the fight, just stand there, watch them. Get away from me, stop breathing on me. Right, <laughs> and see what happens. Again, and these are all, you know, there's four different tools for a reason because not every tool works with every family or anything like that. So like that, maybe if you thought things were getting physical or you were afraid they would, maybe you would sure. beat it, you would bear it. You would sit there and wait, you know, just kind of watching, observing. Exactly, right. exactly. And obviously, right, physical safety. But if you're not right. sure, like, you know, like, okay, has it gotten there yet, you know? That's right. It could. Exactly, exactly. The next one is called... Um, boot them <laughs> and boot them really is to say hey you know you guys are being disruptive and you need to go outside and when you have solved your problem come back in and talk to me so again it's putting the onus of the behavior on the children but also telling them hey when you come to a solution come in and let me know that would be great that's your thing Okay, and, and there is a difference between problem solving with your child and rescuing them. And who can tell me what the difference might be between those two? <laughs> well, rescuing, they never learn to resolve issues themselves. Exactly, exactly. So if we're constantly going in and solving the problem for them, or you did this, you did that, you do this, you do that, they're probably not learning a lot about problem solving on their own. And not building a relationship with the sibling, which if you think about it, in blended families, it's going to be real important, right? Like, how do I get along with this new sibling that I have? Right. You know, if the only way I can get along with them is when there's an adult around to mediate that, we're going to have some tired adults. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Well, and if you think about long term, when, they, when they're adults, exactly. you want them to be able to have those skills be able to solve those problems Absolutely. in the workplace with their own partner that kind of thing. I know like who's worse in the yeah. worst workplace than someone that every time somebody does something wrong has to run to the boss like they're not going to get very far right. like the they boss is like she's a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> right and then the last one is build on it which I already mentioned and essentially that's sitting down with the children and saying hey how can we solve this what are, you, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? We need to write them down. Let's come to consensus. Let's really figure this out and give them the tools to be able to do that. Like teach them some active listening, like how to really mm -hmm. listen to the other person, mm -hmm. which once again goes back to all those things about teaching them how to manage their emotions, slow things down, you know, and just gets them to such a better place. And I know, like you said at the beginning, oh, it's a time. Like how do you have time to do the family meeting once a week? Or anything? But, as a mom who has kids that are older, my three oldest ones are 24, 21, and 18, mm -hmm. you save yourself so much time in the long run if you take the time when they're little to do those kinds of things. Absolutely. It's like sitting down and it, teaching them those skills and how to build that relationship and work out conflict with their sibling when they're five, six, seven, mm -hmm. eight, nine. You do it a few times and they start to get it. It's better than having to intervene every day because they can never do it on their own. Well, and it gets a lot harder once they're teenagers sure to start it to sure do does. that. But not that it's not possible, but it does, it does get a lot get harder. harder. Okay, and I think our last point, and we'll just um, sum it all up with this, is I think one thing that happens when we start in, when we, when we get remarried and we start a blended family is there's a lot of hope mm -hmm. and excitement for the future and for what maybe things weren't trying to make things better. Maybe you had hopes and dreams in that last relationship and this is another chance to 
you know, have some of those things come true and make things better. And I think all that is wonderful and definitely embrace it because there is a lot of hope. I know I started out with a bad statistic, but there is a lot of hope if you acknowledge your past, if you can be brave enough to look in the mirror and say, what happened? What part of it did I have? And part of that means that you have to acknowledge that your partner came to you with the past and you came to your partner with the past. And all of those things in the past are, are contributors to who you are right now. You would be a different person if they didn't have that past. They would be a different person. Um, and so it's not, we don't want to put kids in the position where they can never acknowledge what was. We don't want to put kids in a position where they can never say, gosh, that was really fun when we used to go to the fair every year, you know, with mom. Or it was really fun, you know, when, remember when we all went to Disney World, you know, it was you and dad before you got divorced. Like, you don't want to put kids in a position where they can't acknowledge their own past. And I think it's really, really important in a blended family that when children are coming, coming to, your, to your home and you're making it a home for everybody, that they're allowed to have even reminders of their past in the home. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that you have to hang up a picture of, you know, your ex the day you got married or your spouse's ex the day they got married. I'm not saying that. But, but to truly be into it and trying to make a new future means that there should be nothing wrong with a child having a picture in their bedroom of what their family used to look like. There should be no problems with having a picture of Disney World. Okay? What, what you're saying to that child is that I accept you completely. You don't have to hide it from me. That I accept you completely. And I understand that as adults, it's really hard us to think about our partners and their past relationships and those kinds of things. I understand that that's difficult, but that's kind of what being an adult is, right? Is that you step up and you do the difficult so that the kiddo doesn't have to. And I would say one of the most important things to leave you with is to acknowledge the past with respect. Doesn't mean that it was perfect, but it probably wasn't just completely awful either, you know? And acknowledge that for yourself and acknowledge that for your kids and learn. And we wish you all the best in creating a new, loving, and lasting blended family. Yeah. Anything else, please? Well, just thank you so much for participating and being here. And um, we are open to questions right now. I would um, suggest if you're interested in more resources to check out the website, oneminutemommy.com. And then we are offering free coaching calls if anyone is interested in parent coaching services from both Maureen or I. We have a free 30-minute call that we're offering as well. And, I was, and I'll on say one last thing. It's just that I, I just want to leave with hope because what I really, really want everyone who's watching this to know is mm -hmm. we thank you for joining us and we thank you for your service. Like I know what it's, I know in some ways what it's like. I haven't been the one to go overseas, but I know what it's like to have your spouse come and go and what a challenge that is on a family. I know how hard that is. And I just think with everything that you go through and that you sacrifice, if there's one thing you deserve, it's to have a happy life at home. Not a perfect life, because none of us get that, but a life that, in peace at home. And so I, I just want to leave you with a lot of hope and to know that if things are not peaceful right now and there's, they're not happy right now, I have seen hundreds of families turn it around. You can be one of them, that we all struggle. You can turn it around. You deserve that. And at the very least of what you deserve for everything you've done for our country. So yes. thank you very much. We're here to support you.